Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Barry Hudson, the Director of Public Information for Montgomery County. Today, we would like to give you an update and a reaction to the recent events after the governor's announcement. Today, you will hear from County Executive Elrich. You will also hear from the Montgomery County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Smith, as well as Dr. McKnight, the Deputy Superintendent, and you will hear from Dr. Gales, our health officer. We'll start with County Executive Mark Elrich. So uh, we tried a couple times today to do a press event, and then when the governor announced that he was doing a four o'clock press conference, we decided to delay our event until after he had, he had done his event. And uh, so we've been talking since then to just you know kind of look at what our most immediate response would be. So I'm pretty sure everybody listened to the government's the governor's major recommendations. And there's no question that things are unfolding very rapidly. And we do expect the number of cases to increase. And one of the things we've, you know, I think in, in perspective is that as this thing develops, it's gonna to continue to evolve. And my experience over the last week or so is that things change every day. And sometimes they change multiple times a day. And so people are gonna to have to expect uh, both the changing situation and an alteration of responses based on how the situation changes. I wanted to call this press conference because I want people to know that we're taking every precaution we can take to make the people of Montgomery County as safe as possible. Our county health officer and our director of emergency management and their team have been working around the clock to ensure that we're ready for the worst and we're coordinating very closely with the state. Um, we have had regular communication with the state. Um, I've been, I get texts first thing in the morning, and uh, I will say that they've been letting us know what is happening. And I think you know, part of the problem everybody deals with is how fast the un information is on, can, can unfold. At moments like this, it's really important that everybody stick together. We've got the ability to deal with this collectively. I think we've got a good team. I'm, I'm impressed by the work the governor's done. Um, there are some things that we struggle with, like getting test kits. It would be nice if the President of the United States treated this like an emergency, um, because that's a, major, that's a major problem for us. We, we can't test all the people who we would like to test. But we're not taking any of the decisions we have to make lightly, and we're gonna continue to talk about them and make the best decisions we can make. Um, I'm gonna t discuss some of the immediate actions we're taking today and we're gonna be thoughtful and not act too quickly. As we think about this over the next day or so, we're gonna look at what other things we should do. We're gonna to continue to assess what the science tells us we should do. And I really wanna thank um, Dr. Gales for constantly bringing this discussion back to the science and back to what does science tell us is the right response. But these are the things I can tell you you're gonna see over the next couple of days. Schools will be closed for two weeks starting Monday, March 16th. We will be closing our recreation centers and libraries effective Monday, and that applies to both county facilities and park and planning facilities. Starting Monday, March 16th, county government will move to a telework schedule for all employees who can and take other social distancing and other protective measures for employees who have direct contact with the public. And effective immediately, we'll be following the state's guidelines of a limit of 250 people for public gatherings. Now we can limit this in our space, but we're calling on all the private institutions, whether you're churches or whether you have private rental space, to please observe these limits. This is, 250 is still a lot of people, but we've got to make sure that we minimize the social contact to the greatest degree possible. This situation is no doubt altering our normal way of life. And the challenge is that we don't know how our lives are gonna be altered because the situation remains so fluid. We're working hand in hand, and as this situation evolves, we're gonna to continue to work with the state to make sure that we are informing each other and evolving our practices together. 
I've already been in contact and we're working with the Maryland Department of Health as we investigate our cases and deal with other health-related issues. Again, I want to thank Dr. Gales, Earl Stoddard, and the rest of our staff for the countless hours they've devoted to protecting and preparing this county for the impact of COVID-19. I don't know if everybody realizes, but we've been working on this since January. As soon as this broke, I think everybody understood that this was likely to become what it is now, a pandemic, that we would not be immune, not in this country and certainly not in Montgomery County, and that we would have to be prepared for it. So there's been a lot of work done to get us to the point that we are now, and folks here are gonna work tirelessly to make sure we can keep people safe and ensure the government continues to operate. So at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Smith up to share a few words, thank you. Thank you, County Executive Elrich. And I just wanna start by saying that we have received many, many messages from the families and parents of Montgomery County. And we understand the anxiety. We understand how people feel and the many different perspectives on school being open, closed, all the different ways of thinking about that. We have depended and found a great partner in Dr. Crowell at HHS and Dr. Travis Gales, who's standing over here next to me, as we've worked with them hourly over the last couple of weeks. We've also been in close communication and close work with our county executive and all of his staff, as well as all of our county uh, council members and, and Mr. Katz as president. We really cannot say how much we appreciate the way people have come together and worked together because as Mr. Elbridge said, we're all in this boat together and we have to treat one another like we're in a boat together. And many, many things have been said. I just wanna make one point before I turn it over to Dr. McKnight because I'm gonna give her a chance to share some of the work that she's been directly engaged in and taking point on in the school system. But one of the things that was said in the press conference by the governor's office was that, well, you could use spring break to make up the days. We need to understand that we will figure that out with our associations, with our community, all of those things. We have days printed on our calendar that we use as makeup, and there's a whole system that we know well about how that works. So I just want people not to cancel any plans right now. We'll be back in touch with you soon, but just let us think through this and figure out what makes the most sense given where we are right now today, because as Mr. Elrich said, everything has been changing hourly. So Dr. McKnight, Please share with some of uh, the work we've been doing. All right. Good afternoon. Um, and I'd just like to quickly share that today on the press conference, it was confirmed that Montgomery County Public Schools will be closed for a two-week period beginning March 16th through March 27th. Over that two-week period, we are going to focus on providing extensive cleaning in all of our schools and facilities so that when we are disinfecting and cleaning the areas in which our students have used and preparing those areas for their return after March 27th. I'd also like to share that we've been collaborating with our county partners and community advocates to make necessities such as meals available for our students who are in need. We are coupling our current structures that we use in uh, cases like inclement weather and summer meals program and combining them with county resources to determine the best way to serve our students during this time. So those conversations are happening and we are preparing for that. We will share with our community and students the plan for educational activities and resources to utilize over the two week period that school is closed. We have planned to provide resources that are created specifically for elementary, middle, and high school students. So we'll be sharing through our various communication methods exactly what those resources will be and how they will be accessed by all of our students. So the, as Dr. Smith just mentioned, there was a suggestion earlier about making sure we uh, had our makeup days planned for. So we are in conversations with the state superintendent after the press conference today, really discussing exactly what that would look like. Our plan internally is to be able to share publicly a plan with you by Tuesday of next week of how we intend to utilize makeup days for the two week period that our students are not in school. We're also gonna to continue to focus on communication to make sure that everyone has access to timely and accurate communication so that we can navigate all of the things that will occur over the next two weeks that schools are closed. So we are going to continue to update our webpage um, that we have on the MCPS website dedicated to COVID-19. And that website will also include information for our parent community, our students specifically. We have heard from our students. We want them to know that we are sending messages specifically to them 
about things that they can utilize, resources they can utilize, and also just opportunities to hear their voices. So on that website, we will continue to make updates for our community members, our students. We'll also use connected messages, which many of our families are familiar with. And we'll also make sure we are posting things on social media. And we will also make sure all of this information is provided in multiple languages so that we are addressing the needs of everyone in our community here in Montgomery County Public Schools. So with that, um, I will now hand it over to Dr. Travis Gales, the County Chief Health Officer. Good evening, everyone. Before we get into formal remarks, I want to take this opportunity to thank those who are our frontline staff who don't get to come up in front of the, the press conferences and get highlighted, but the folks who are working in the front line in our agency in Health and Human Services, Public Health Services, and across HHS, and all of the other inter, uh, government agencies across the county. The work that they do is tremendous. It's um, exhausting, but they are committed to it, and because of them, we're able to launch the different initiatives that we are putting forward uh, and if there are issues with our response we will hope to be nimbly responding to that to address your concerns now that said we were here Friday we talked about this we talked about our first couple of cases and since then we've seen some new cases I want to emphasize as we talked about on Friday the same level of calmness and sense of, of, of relaxation if you will in terms of dealing with anxiety uh, relaxation may not be the appropriate word, but I want to convey to you that the messages that we relay to you on Friday, we stand by and we continue to support. We know that individuals, the, the risk of COVID-19 to the overwhelming majority of the public is low, uh, but we also recognize with new information that now there's evidence that we see community transmission within our, our communities. And what we talked about also was that we would adjust our response dependent upon the clinical data and the epidemiologic data. And so what has changed from Friday to today is, yes, we've seen more cases, but we've also seen a change as most of those cases and all of the cases in Montgomery County so far have been travel related, but we've seen the evidence of community transmission in other jurisdictions close by. So that necessitates us to alter our course and change what we're doing, but does not raise the level of suspicion and concern from what we talked about on last Friday. A couple of things to highlight is that we talked a lot about closures and closures of schools. I want people to also understand that again, as I mentioned last Friday, that does not mean you're going to see everyone walking around in public in hazmat suits and protection gear. What it means is we recognize dynamics have changed and we need to be a little bit more proactive in terms of implementing strategies to address that. So I can imagine you sitting at home hearing a press conference, now two press conferences, talking about the need to have closures. I want you to understand that doesn't mean we have an over influx of cases right now. It's putting into actions things to prevent us from getting to that point. Now, there are certain populations that we know we have to address. I'll give you a perfect example. We've been talking about older populations and those over the age of 60. Had a really good conversation with my parents this morning, and I'm not going to tell you their age because my mother would get upset, but they are over the age of 60 and doing very well. Uh, but we talked this morning about the concept of what does this mean in their world? And so we talked about social distancing, and I know we've talked a lot about that term back and forth. What social distancing means overall is being very thoughtful and careful in terms of your interactions with other folks. So yes, there is a set definition. We should stand a meter apart from each other or three feet apart from each other. That's hard to do. But what you can do is limit your contact in terms of coming into contact with individuals who are developing symptoms, limiting your extended exposure out in public. For example, I talked to my parents, they're in civic organizations, I talked about maybe it's a good idea to postpone those meetings for a few weeks and cut down on your, your exposure. Continue to live your daily life, but be very thoughtful and careful about your interactions. If you are developing or experiencing symptoms, stay home, talk to your medical provider, get advice on how you need to access services. We do know that providers are moving to alternative strategies such as telemedicine to be able to provide outreach to their clients without having them to have to come in. We also are recommending for those in those groups, because we don't want you out as much, make sure that you're proactive in terms of making sure your prescriptions are filled. 
So if something's about to end, make sure you get adequate supply of your medications. Make sure you do do some grocery shopping and prepare. I have to do some after this. Not sure how much will be left to the grocery stores when I go home. But be smart in terms of your interactions. And so when we put these restrictions in place in terms of group gatherings and those types of things, we're trying to protect folks and cut down on the risk of extended expansive community transmission. So I think those are the, the big pieces of advice. We'll have questions, but I do want to reiterate what we talked about on Friday. I do want you to rest assured that, again, the, over, the risk to the overwhelming majority of the population still remains low, and these actions that have been put into place are extra precautionary measures to make sure that risk stays that way. So we're going to take a couple of questions, but before we do that, I want to recognize our council members. Uh, they are all here. They were here last Friday. It shows, once again, the collective force that the county has behind this to make sure that our residents are safe and make sure that our residents are protected. Um, but we'll start taking questions now. Sure, so as Council Executive, uh, County Executive Elridge mentioned, we've been planning for this since January, and we've engaged with our hospitals, uh, hospital partners from the very beginning, and that, those conversations have escalated. And so what those conversations center on are making sure that we have provisions in place to protect the integrity of the emergency rooms, making sure that we create opportunities uh, potentially for folks to uh, expand the testing network, um, providing guidance to uh, community folk to understand, to talk to their medical providers, get guidance, not necessarily coming directly to the emergency room. As things potentially escalate and move forward, it'll be important that the hospitals and the emergency rooms are free in terms of access, easier access for individuals who have more severe symptoms and may necessitate an escalation of medical care on an inpatient uh, basis. So we've been in daily communication talking about how we can structure some of those. We don't have any specifics, but how we can move forward with that. And also talking about what it looks like in terms of uh, surge capacity should the number of folks experiencing symptoms requiring testing will escalate. We also are talking about, again, how we can continue Continue the message of providing that sense of assuredness and comfort to the community. Uh, I know that some of the steps that they have taken uh, have been in terms of restricting visitation. Um, again, putting in uh, plans and policies that will cut down on the risk for the general public, but also for those who are in, uh, hospitalized. So all options are on the table. Uh, we're very actively exploring options to increase access to testing. So again, referencing back to our conversation on Friday, uh, it's important to be able to create op opportunities and spaces for people to be able to easily access medical services. And we know that in this space, insurance status, immigration status, there's a whole host of things that may complicate an individual's ability to access services to get a test. And so we're working to develop strategies that could potentially, you know, again, no specifics, could potentially include something like that. Uh, in addition to looking at our capacity, as well as looking at other jurisdictions to see how they stand those up. The uh, mobile unit in Denver, uh, it's not open to the general public. You still actually have to have a doctor's note that you require a test, and I think that's important to understand uh, because right now the testing parameters are still based upon kind of a review to determine if you meet criteria based upon your history, your level of exposures that may warrant whether or not you necessitate a test. Concerned that they may be sick? 
Well, it, to frame that question, I also want to remind folks that uh, COVID-19 isn't the only health condition that's happening right now. We are still in flu season. Uh, it's the beginning of allergy season. Uh, and so there are other things that are happening that are requiring folks to seek medical care. So again, going back to the point of we want to make sure that we educate the public and get the right information out there uh, so that our emergency rooms aren't overly burdened um, and are utilized by those who need it the most. So to answer your question directly with that framework in mind, uh, I think they are experiencing some capacity issues in terms of, you know, consistent with a, an intense flu season. Uh, and again, that's why we're working to try to figure out other avenues where patients can seek care so they're not only utilizing the emergency room as their source of screening and their source of medical treatment. Calls on the guy with police authority. Um, we're, we're hoping on an honor code. I mean, we don't have the resources to go and look at every private facility and every church and, and count the number of people in there. And we're hoping that everybody understands this and takes this as seriously as we're doing. We wouldn't have said a limit of 250 if we didn't think it was important. And we're hoping that everybody, you know, reflects on that and they, everybody acts accordingly. And, uh, I think most county residents and most institutions that consider this home and who share our concern for the welfare of their fellow residents here will, t will take that into consideration. But we hope that this is, this is something that everybody understands why we're doing it. There's, this is not fun for any of us. If you've been given the news, I'm, yeah. Well, with the younger children, someone has to stay home with them, and this is critical. Elementary school kids are, you know, frankly, our biggest concern, and we're hoping, you know, that some things are beyond our control, but we're hoping that the federal government and the state government recognize that it would be wrong to put adults in a situation where they have to choose between taking care of their kids and not going to work and not earning the money they need to make a mortgage payment or rent. And that's why this is a national crisis. It's not going to be solved by those of us at the local level. We need the federal government to step up with some form of income guarantees or protection for people so that somebody doesn't stay home and take care of their kids and then discover they're getting evicted the next month for non-payment or rent. And if there was ever a need, <laughs> many times, but if there ever need for national policy and something that is informed by compassion and understanding what the implications of this are, it's right now. It's not in anybody's interest to have these people go to work, potentially sick, or leave elementary school age kids, or kids in daycare, think about this, the kids from the daycare centers or the daycare centers might be closed, to leave them home alone. And so the government's got to step up and step in, I think, to make sure that, that people are made whole. We're asking people to do this, you know, for the good of everyone. And we think that, you know, the federal government's got a huge responsibility in this in making sure that, that people can handle it. But we want people to do the responsible thing. The idea of little kids home alone is not a good idea. I guess the you know one thing we've talked a little bit about is congregating in places, you know, for example, if all the kids go to the mall. So you've kind of defeated the purpose of social social isolation if something like that happens. So we're thinking about what's an appropriate response, but if you know, they can congregate in parks and other places on Saturday and Sunday. 
So I don't know if I've got any more worry about what they do on a weekday. And in fact, when they have spring break, they're free to do that. So that to me is not the big dramatic thing. It's like whatever they do, I hope that we can convey to them the importance of not taking this opportunity to congregate. We're trying to keep them safe. We hope their parents send that message very clearly to them. We hope the schools before um, they dismiss them, relay a message of, you know, this is not a vacation period we're giving you as a bonus. We're doing this because a lot of people are at risk and we really want you to play your part. I mean, I don't think it's too much to ask young people to play a part in making sure their community stays safe. We hope we can convey that. Is there any Last question. Uh, sure. So I am actually happy to report that our three original cases that we talked about on Friday have convalesced done well. They have cleared um, and received negative results, so they've been cleared um, and are, are free to return to normal life. Uh, the remaining cases so far um, are all convalescing well at home, those that have been identified as Montgomery County um, residents. Uh, so fortunately, that is a, a, a good reminder that we've talked about to enforce that um, having a diagnosis of COVID-19 uh, does not mean that you will have severe illness. Um, as demonstrated by all of the cases in the county so far to date, um, in spite of the age, because if you remember, um, those three individuals were, I think, mid 50s and 70 and above, they've all done well. And so that suggests again, as a reminder to folks that the diagnosis does not mean severe illness. Um, the majority of folks will have a mild to moderate set of symptoms um, and recover fully. Okay, that's it. Just a couple things. Make sure you uh, go to our website. The web county website will have updated information on it. Also, make sure to follow Twitter and Facebook, both the county and all of our council members as well. Um, and if you have not signed up for uh, our emergency alerts, please go to the website and do that as well. Thank you very much.